I need to tell you something, and that is that I have really bad vertigo right now. So if I fall down, uh, just <laughs> you all are moving right now, and uh, and I'm not. Oh, you don't have to sing. I'm just gonna. No, no, no. Just. I lean on Jesus. I don't lean on chairs. That's pretty good. <laughs> Jesus, that was no Jesus, that was David. <laughs> wow, we're not getting anywhere today. I was thinking you guys would all go, oh, let's pray for him while we do this, you know, but never mind, I'm just going to go into this. I can't, read a, I can't read a lot, so I may go without notes today, but um, we've been in this series now, this is the second week, this has been going on and on, uh, on the fruit of the Spirit, and uh, I wanted to preach a series on the keys to the kingdom, and I told the staff that, and uh, Chris wanted to preach on the Beatitudes, and he told the staff that, and then Janice said, well, we're doing the fruit of the Spirit, and uh, we went, okay, we'll just do it from our unique perspectives. <laughs> so, but the fruit of the Spirit, which I believe are the keys to the kingdom, really, um, <laughs> today we're going to be looking at joy. and. Um, I gotta tell you the truth, this week I didn't really feel like preaching on this one and I thought about, you know, you can jump further in and take a different one. You don't have to do them in order. But then I thought, yeah, we have to take God's word the way it comes to us, whether we feel like it or not. So um, in Galatians chapter five, uh, Paul writes, it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, do not let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. And then later in the chapter, he says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And against such things, there's no law. So Lord, teach us about the fruit that comes from your Spirit in our lives and how we might reflect who you are uh, in our world today and with the people around us. And uh, teach us in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, you know that I'm not a gardener uh, at all. Well, I am a gardener, but I'm a really bad one. And, uh, and I was thinking, you know, we're getting towards summer here. It's been pretty hot and warm and sunny and everything. And I planted these three tomato plants, two in a planter and one on one of those upside down hanging things. And uh, you know how many, the rich harvest I've gotten from these zero and i was thinking yesterday i should go out and scold these plants because they're obviously not trying hard enough and if they were more disciplined and if they worked harder at it and maybe a little more sincere i'd be getting the fruit right wow some of you are nodding yes that's what you should do <laughs> This is a strange group. Okay, so actually, I found that doing that is pretty ineffective. Uh, lecturing plants doesn't make them more fruitful. Um, actually, giving them the right nutrients and maybe watering them once in a while would help. Uh, but that's a whole other thing. So, but I have struggled in my life with this idea of if you're missing something like joy, the thing you need to do is get yourself together. Be more disciplined. And uh, for me, that's not a natural thing, but it is something that I feel guilty for not doing more of. Um, last week, I decided I was going to go to Safeway for uh, a stock up shopping. You know what that is? You know where you really get everything? And, uh, and so I uh, filled the cart and I thought it would be selfish of me to go through the checkout line and have everybody waiting behind me. That's not thoughtful. I'll go to the self-checkout <laughs> counter. You ever done that? Your store have that one? The self-checkout. I thought, you know, this is really, that, that's what a good Christian should do, especially when they have a cartload of stuff. So I went in, and you know that voice that talks to you? You know? Scolding, really. Uh, place the item in the bagging area. Okay. <laughs> Place the item on the scale, or take the item off the scale. 
place it in the back. And, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, you know, I'm patient. I'm just going along, I'm doing this. And I had a lot of stuff. And so some of it I put in bags, those little flimsy plastic ones, you know, but sometimes the plastic things didn't open up fast enough for me. And the voice was starting to get scolding. So I just set it down on the thing. And uh, pretty soon I had things piled up all over. And, uh, <laughs> but I, I got through it. I weathered it until the very end. And the voice said, please remove items from the bagging area. I thought, okay, yeah. And I, and I ended up having like 12 little plastic bags and four 12 packs of soda and all that stuff. And I'm putting them in the bags and I'm trying to get them packed in right and get them in the car. And the voice, like, it was mean. It was, please remove items from the bagging area. And I'm doing that, and then please remove items from the bag. And to me, it sounded like it was getting louder. Please remove <laughs> items from the bag. And then it was like on a cycle. Please remove items from the bagging area. Please remove items. And, and I thought to myself, I'm trying to. Leave me alone. <laughs> and suddenly, all the people around me turned and looked. <laughs> and I thought, maybe I didn't think that just to myself. <laughs> Maybe I actually shouted at the voice. I'm trying, leave me alone. I, I finished removing the items from the bagging area, got them in the car, and then I had to do that walk of shame. You know, where you're going out with your head held high, but you know everybody's going, what an idiot. You know, geez, get him back to the home. You know, and uh, and then I thought of the church. Uh, I can't help. I thought of the church. I was walking out my walk of shame out to the car, thinking I was going to do something good that day and help everybody and take care of it myself and not worry about anybody else. I was doing the best I can, and I felt so much shame and and scolded. And I thought, man, I have spent a lifetime going to church and being scolded. Why don't you have more joy in your life? <laughs> if you were a better Christian, you'd have more joy in your life. If you, if you were more disciplined in your spiritual life, you'd have more joy. If you wouldn't waste your time doing this and that, you would have to get your items off the bagging area. <laughs> you idiot. <laughs> so... Today I've turned to, if I can find it, uh, Philippians. Chapter three. And uh, it strikes me that um, there's a tension in our lives between our experience of joy and our desperate efforts to get our lives together so that we can experience joy. And it's just the opposite of what God wants to have happen in us. It is just the opposite. God is not, I, I should tell you this, God is not that nagging, abrasive voice in the Safeway checkout line. Oh, I didn't say what store it was. Yeah, you did. Finally, rejoice in the Lord. Chapter 3 of Philippians. It's no trouble for me to write this to you again. And it's a safeguard for you. Finally, rejoice in the Lord. And they said, watch out for those dogs, those people, they have all these rules and I put no confidence in the flesh. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already attained it. I've already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Jesus Christ took hold of me. You know, the last word that Paul wants to say to us, finally, rejoice. And don't get brought down by those who would set up 
more discipline issues for you and more work to do and, and prove that you have to do the walk of shame because you didn't get it right or fast enough or good enough. Don't let them get to you. Rejoice in the Lord. That's what I wants to tell you. Now, I gotta admit that my life has not been a smooth journey towards uh, happiness and joy, right? Uh, it's, it's been pretty average, uh, slugging along in the swamp most of the time, but, but it's been, uh, but I do believe with all my heart that, that the Bible tells us and, and God never intended there to be somber Christians. I've been around a few, and I think that that's probably one of those oxymorons, somber Christians, like Reverend Westfall. You know, it's kind of, they, don't, <laughs> they don't really go together. But um, uh, have you ever been around someone who, when you're with them, you just feel less? You feel less joy, less alive, less smart, less who you are? They just... They, they would actually stifle your joy or rob your joy instead of unleashing it. See, God wants our, our joy to be unleashed. Jesus said, I've told you this so that my joy would be in you and your joy would be full. That's, that's why I'm saying this stuff to you. Now, if we lose sight of why Jesus is saying these things to us. If we lose sight of the joy, we let it be stifled, we let it be robbed, we let it be squelched in our life by others, by circumstances, by our own inaction or action. We miss the whole point. I don't want to miss the whole point. But on the same time, you know, the Bible, I, I've told you this before, the Bible's full of reality, right? Life isn't easy. And in fact, uh, you can pick up almost any of the New Testament books in the New Testament and read them, and they're all about, as you're getting through this issue and that issue and this trial and this, and, and yet somehow we're supposed to experience joy in the midst of those things. But, but realizing you know, we're not fantasy land. We're not going, oh, life's so great. Everything's good. And we're just doing well. Uh, it's stressful. Uh, I found this, uh, the Atlantic Journal, um, June 16th. So pretty. The world is too big for us. Too much is going on. Too many crimes. Too much violence and excitement. Try as you will. You get behind in the race in spite of yourself. It's a constant strain to keep pace and still you lose ground. Science empties its discoveries on you so fast that you stagger beneath them in hopeless bewilderment. The political world is news seen rapidly. You're out of breath trying to keep pace with who's in and who's out. Everything is high pressure. Human nature cannot endure much more. The Atlantic Journal, June 16th, 1883. <laughs> 1883. We can't endure much more of this. And yet, how do we find joy in it? How do we discover joy? How do we get surprised by joy? And uh, <clears throat> Paul knew all about the hardships, the strain, you know, there's, he, he doesn't hold that back. But at the same time, he says the last word, finally, the last word is rejoice in the Lord. Don't get worn down by the others. Rejoice in the Lord. And uh, the interesting thing, uh, do the words say, the word, the word for joy is uh, kara, C-H-A-R-A in English, uh, kara. And uh, it's the same root that's used in the word character. Right? Character. That the, the marks of who we are is the indelible marks of joy on our lives. In the midst of issues, in the midst of problems, it's that we have a sense of uh, gratitude, well-being, uh, confidence that, that we're in God's care, and that there's a, a, 
this, this can make sense in the end. And that we can trust the Lord. And, and we have the, and it becomes our character, who we are. Not something we put on, not a smile that we put on so that, so that we can fool some people into thinking everything's okay. And I gotta tell you, it is, it is a slippery slope when we start trying to put our lives together. I was just thinking about this myself. Um, I thought, you know, what I really need to do is probably not really go on a diet, but I ought to eat healthier. And so, you know, I, I saw this book at Barnes & Noble that was uh, Green Shakes. Uh, and a whole recipe book of like grass clippings. <laughs> and the, you know, you put some dandelion greens and you put, I don't know, kale, whatever the heck. And uh, nobody even ate kale. That was something you threw away with the uh, gardening uh, before, but uh, now we eat that with a dandelion green. In a shake, of course, because that's tasty. And, uh, you know. <laughs> All those things, and I even bought 24 of those protein things at Costco. It tastes like chemical waste. <laughs> I'm going to eat better, you know, and uh, more vegetables and less stuff I like. And um, But then I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute. I took a selfie this week and put it on Facebook at a golf course I was visiting, and all people commented on was, well, you look scruffy. That beard is a little rangy. What's wrong with you? You know? And I thought, you know, if I wet it and comb it with a tightly toothed comb, I could probably tame it in time. And then people wouldn't think I was scruffy. I'd have to work on it a little bit every day, but I could train it maybe. And, uh, and, but while I'm doing that, I really ought to polish my shoes more. <laughs> you know, is that, <laughs> what can I say? But if I do that, then I'm thinking, you know, if I really wanted to make a difference, I should figure out those socks. You know, I've got not just a sock drawer, I've got three and a bag and nothing matches. And if I'm going to have nice polished shoes, I should have socks that match. I could do that in a few weeks. And, um, but then I thought, you know, you don't really iron your shirts. You need to be doing that, even if it's hot. Yeah, I, I should. I'd take time to do that. But then, so I broke a tooth having lunch with Dave, and I went to, <laughs> went to the dentist where his wife works, and she came in and was horrified. And uh, she told me that I need to be using a Sonicare uh, electronic high voltage uh, tooth thing uh, if I'm going to make it at all. So I went to Costco and got one, 80 bucks. That thing is like it vibrates your head off. <laughs> and if you hit the teeth with the wrong side, but I'm going to be doing this because it's going to make me a better man. And, uh, and I don't want Diane mad at me, sorry, <laughs> uh, you understand. But, um, and, but then I thought, you know, really, uh, they say that your brain deteriorates if you don't exercise right, and they say that walking five miles a day will help your brain not deteriorate. So I could start walking five miles a day, maybe before I use the Sonicare. <laughs> uh, but I really want to spend time journaling. I, I've told you about that, and I'm thinking if I were to start a journal, I could get up earlier and really spend some time with the Lord and journal and those things before I go on the five mile walk with the Sonicare and the shiny shoes and the matched socks and and the green shake waiting for me at the end of the day. And uh, But then I thought, you know, I don't understand the computer stuff very well and I'm not good at stuff and I want to blog more. It's been like two and a half years since I put a new blog up. and. Uh, I should take a class at the community college on how to do computers and really be good at it and blog with confidence. So I could take a class a couple of nights a week on that and um, that would help. But what I really want to do is take a cooking class because that would be more fun. I could, I could work on healthier cooking and I could be in a class that I could do that on weekends. And, um, but what's really important to me is I need to read more because I used to read a lot and I'm not reading that much now. And I should get a couple of books and keep them 
handy. So I could take like maybe an hour after I come back from the walk and I could read before I start my day. Um, but you know, I feel like the Lord wants me to be investing in people. And so what I really need to do is start initiating more appointments with people to meet them for coffee and talk about their life and introduce them to Jesus when I can and those kinds of things. Maybe if I watch less TV, listen to less music. But then the music, I should take guitar lessons and get better. <laughs> And banjo, really. Both. Don't know when I'll ever use that, but that would be good. I'd have to practice about an hour a day. You know, this self-help thing is crap. <laughs> there is no end to it. I'm just thinking, there's not a bad thing in there to do, and yet it could destroy my entire life. And would it result in joy? No, I'd be resentful. Why do I have to drink green shakes after walking five miles? That's just wrong. <laughs> Sonic care, vibrate your teeth out. Okay, yeah. Don't tell Dan I said that. <laughs> oh, whoa. Yeah, but, uh, you know, I'm just thinking you will never have joy with a self improvement program. It will not happen. I promise you. Now, if, if, if you want to do some stuff uh, to be a better person and we want to work on that, that's great. If the Lord leads you to it, that's great. But when you start saying, I'm going to get it all together and then I'll have some joy, guess what won't be there waiting for you? The joy. Because God wants to meet us in the middle of it all and surprise us and in the midst of really hard painful things discover that we're grateful and and that we are loved and that we do belong and we're not off on our own fixing ourselves finally rejoice in the lord don't get diverted I think if uh, you really want a self-improvement program, the best thing you can do is begin to look at people differently. And as you walk into a room, you say, Lord, who do you want me to talk to now? Who do you want me to hear? Help me notice. How, how can I make a difference? Lord, what, what do I need to give to make a difference? What do I need to do to, to help somebody? How can I look out at my world with your eyes instead of my own? How can, I, how can I have your priorities instead of my priorities? I don't think Jesus gives a darn if I have green shakes or not. If I have green shakes every day, do you think Jesus would love me one bit more? Uh-uh. And if I didn't, would he love me less? Nah. He made you. He knows you. He calls you by name. He loves you. And he wants his joy to be in you and your joy to be full. Don't allow me, the church, your mother's voice on a recording from growing up, anything, divert you from coming alive. And knowing Jesus and the power of his resurrection in your life. And that power is strong enough to loosen up our grip on our life and on the people around us. Help us relax a little bit. It's strong enough to draw us into new relationships, and which we'll probably hurt again, you know, now and then. But we'll know we're loved. And he's strong enough to send us out into our life not having to do the walk of shame because we didn't keep up with the mechanical voice. Jesus does not speak into your life in that voice that was in the Safeway checkout line. By the way, I think they ought to put that voice to the regular professional checkers. <laughs> Let them hear it all day long. Yeah. Oh wait, I'm, I'm robbing their joy. See what happens? It's so quick it turns. Oh man. But finally, 
Finally, rejoice in the Lord. It's no trouble for me to write that to you again. And it's a safeguard for you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we need you. We love you. And we confess we get so diverted with trying to fix ourselves and fix the people around us and make everything seem right. And along the way, we miss the joy that you have for us. So give us the courage to trust you and to seek you and to allow you to love us and to love through us. We give you the glory. Amen.